Brazilians and you've also got some Swiss. <laughs> so thank you for representing the world for us. Um, we are not insular in Silicon Valley. Um, we've got some great venture capitalists here tonight and I'm going to let Martha Hernandez, who is the moderator, she's going to introduce them and then they're going to introduce themselves. Um, and they're going to have a chat about scaling their startups. And um, after the talk at 8 o'clock, we'll have um, some pitches. At the moment, I think there's only one pitch. Is the other person with the demo table here? No. Okay, so we might only have one pitch and then there's some more networking before we wind up. So over to Martha and thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for organizing this event and thank you all for being here. Um, those from Brazil, I've heard a lot about Latin America and Brazil, of course being on the map as it pertains to startups. So thank you for being here, and we'd love to hear your questions and perspectives. Uh, we're going to open it up um, maybe 20 to 30 minutes within the panel discussion, and then uh, if you have any pressing questions, make, make sure that you um, let us know. I think we are all open to having a conversational uh, panel discussion. My name is Marta Hernandez, and I am the CEO and founder of Mayboss, Made by Myself, which is a mobile app that focuses on millennials that work dead end jobs or low wage jobs in retail, particularly grocery, um, and that need a path to a career that pays more. <laughs> um, and I'm going to, well, I'll let you introduce yourselves. I have a question that I would like to ask before we um, start with. All the other questions that I have, and I know that um, many of you took uh, one of the um, index cards we have. So if you have that, I'd love, love to have that now, and then make sure that we get that asked throughout, okay? Um, so you can just uh, pass them up, and I'll put them here on our table if you have them. Um, so why don't we start with just having to let tell us about what this topic is. Well, this topic is about scaling startups. And I know that you had both a trajectory, right, in the VC world. So you've probably seen a lot. And um, as you tell us your story or how you began in this world, this exciting world, um, what has been your most interesting story? Um, from a, a scalability standpoint of a startup that you've supported in the past. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for having me and thank you all for coming. Um, so uh, I'm Troy Chavalia with TFJ. We are a real estate investment firm uh, based in Melbourne Park in San Francisco. Uh, I, we have two distinct funds, an early stage and growth fund. I do mostly early stage. What that means is effectively seed and series A investing, where we typically write two to $15 million checks uh, we're active investors who so take board seats um, uh, and invest kind of across consumer frontier um, at enterprise. Um, so to answer your question on the most exciting scaling story, um, so before joining DFJ, I was in another firm where I invested in Dollar Shave Club. Um, and when we invested, this was in the C round. Um, and so right after we uh, we did the C round, the viral video went live. Um, I don't know if any of you have watched the Dollar Shave Club viral video, it ended up getting like 15 million sort of views and counting, but um, we had no idea that it would have that sort of level of success. And so all of the insane insanity, sort of the mayhem that came when that video hit the internet, um, servers crashing, complete inability to keep up with demand for several months, um, having to rethink all of our processes, having to rethink what the scale of the business would be, right? We were like, this is a cool idea, like there should be this you know, sort of next gen men's grooming company, but you know, to think that it would scale as quickly as it did and get to the kind of sort of outcome that it has, I mean, that was something that we were hoping for at the seed stage, but never saw it coming as quickly as it would. So I think that was my most fun scaling experience. We just like, everything broke, um, and we had to re sort of build the business. That's a tough scaling story to beat, I must admit. Um, quick on my background, so I'm Pat Wilhelm, I'm at Scale Venture Partners. I think you can think of scale as being the bucket in between their early stage fund and their growth stage fund. So if their early fund does seed Series A, we do Series A, Series B, a little bit of Series C, and then DFJ Growth would come in and say, you know, Series C, D, E, F, G, whatever it requires. Uh, so we're mid-stage, we're enterprise focused, enterprise software focused, so when I say enterprise, I mean not consumer, when I say software, I mean not hardware. Uh, that said, you know, lots of businesses today have a consumer element or a little bit of hardware here, so we're sort of loosening our constraints slightly, but broadly, enterprise software 
we two active investors take board seats, tend to write checks that are six, eight, ten, twelve million dollars. Uh, I prior to scale, I was at Cloudera and I was at Oracle before that, and I think my scaling story, which is maybe my personal scaling story as opposed to scale investment, but Cloudera was is sort of the classic scaling case. I was employee number 101. I remember because the first 100 employees got this cool, fancy thing, and I didn't get it because I was the first one not to. But Friday, Cloudera went public. Uh, so Cloudera, you know, it was a long road. I was an early inside sales rep, unglorious position. And thinking about it in the scaling terms, when I joined Cloudera, it was inside sales, outside sales, period. No BDRs, no channel, no partners, no... There were 20 of us at sales kickoff, and I just heard this year there were more than a thousand people at sales kickoff. It was in Orlando, it was a big deal. Um, so watching that with the lens of having been there when it was tiny was really cool. That's great. Now you guys can hear me. Good. Um, so when thinking about scale, everyone thinks obviously scale growth, um, timing, how to scale, right? The, the, the way in which you scale. There's so many factors, right, that, come, that go into this notion of scaling. Um, but what are some of the myths that you think need to be deconstructed in order for people to have a more um, either logical approach or prepared approach? I know that things happen, and you just gave us an exact story about not being prepared for that um, scale uh, or that um, growth. But what are some logical steps that startups should you know, be thinking about when they're thinking about growth? Sure. So, um, I mean, I, I guess all of us wouldn't be here unless we, you know, I, I'm assuming that you guys are sort of building businesses for the most part and um, are thinking about building sort of venture scale businesses. But I guess the first thing to, to sort of decide as you think about scale is if you are building a venture sort of scale business or if you're trying to build a business that's more sort of, um, you know, stable growth, maybe not as hockey stick like growth as venture capitalists like to see, but businesses that can be very lucrative in the long run as well, right? And so I think there's the decision tree kind of early in the life cycle of companies, um, you know, that, that where, where you have to decide whether or not venture capital makes sense for you. And I think for 95% of entrepreneurs, venture capital does not make sense, right? And so um, I think scale looks different under those sort of two contexts. Um, what, what we look at when we think about you know, whether or not these are going to scale um, are a couple of really basic things, right? So one, um, you know, is there a product market fit? And really what that means to us is, have you figured out, are, are you selling um, a similar product to a repeatable set of customers in some predictable manner, right? So if you have a sales and go to market sort of channel that works, um, and, and, and what kind of visibility you have there, right? So I think that tells us that something is ready to scale, right? That you put dollars in when it comes to customer acquisition and product development, um, and that some sort of, uh, something productive will come out of it, I guess, that sort of happens in a high growth manner. So I guess that's like the textbook definition of scale, but that's kind of how we think about sort of just at the most basic level, whether or not something's ready to scale, right? And then there's all sorts of things that you have to think about in terms of like processes, human capital, um, you know, other things that you can do to sort of prepare your business, but at the fundamental level it's, you know, product market fit and a sales channel that will scale. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think before, what I would add before that is it is all about the people and getting the right people on the bus. And I think when deals kind of get to Series B level, the Series A and the C investors have done a lot of the vetting of are these the right people, are the right people for the job, are, is there chemistry between and amongst the founders, have they done a, done a good job of hiring other people, uh, because if you have A plus players, you're going to build an A plus team. If you have B plus players, you're going to build a B plus team. A lot of that has been solved to scale to the point of product market fit. Uh, and then, I mean, we can, it depends on what you guys want to hear, but we can double click and talk extensively about sales efficiency and magic number and when it really makes sense to push on the pedal, not push on the pedal, how data can inform your decisions. But I think you're exactly right. So when, when do you not push on the panel? What are some of the red flags to start looking at um, whether you have a business now or a startup now um, or 
if in the future you think about scaling, what are some of these red flags that people should be thinking about? Yeah, so we, we yeah, so digging into data, I mean, I think at the Series A stage, you're spending a lot of money on R&D because you're building the product. You're deciding this is binary, is it going to work, this is not going to work. At Series B, you're spending probably 3x what you are in R&D in sales and marketing. So you're plowing money into sales and marketing and you're saying, let's scale, let's scale, let's scale, scale, let's do it fast, as fast as we can. Right? I mean, there are going to be extra, external factors. If there are other competitors, you're going to want to scale faster because you're going to do the land grab. Maybe if there aren't, maybe you can you know, simmer and not grow quite as fast. Uh, the beauty with mid-stage product market fit, when you have customers that are paying you money, you should have data from the top of the funnel to the bottom of the funnel, you know, top of marketing funnel. So visitor hits your website, they convert into, you know, they fill out a form, then they're marketing qualified leads, sales qualified leads, close, close one, close lost, whatever it is. You know, you have numbers for people coming through this funnel. And so empirically, you should be able to say, is this process working? Is this process not working? And so to your question, is there a time to push on the pedal or let up? Um, when the process is working and you know, we can get into it, but if your sales efficiency and your magic number, so essentially like the change in your top line, whether it's revenue or ARR, over the amount of money you spend on sales and marketing. So that's, you know, that, that's telling you exactly how efficient are you. If that number is over one, it's great. If it's 0.7, 0 0.8, it's pretty good. If it's below 0 0.5, you should pretty much stop what you're doing. You should determine that this flow is not flowing as smoothly smoothly as it ought to. And, and then you need to really look in the mirror and say, is this working? Yeah, I guess from my consumer lens, I, so I mostly focus on consumer investing. Um, you know, a rule of thumb for us is early on in uh, a company's life cycle, um, you know, LTV cap should pencil out very generously, right? So um, over time, customer acquisition cost typically goes up in a consumer company. Um, you lose efficiencies in your visual marketing channels over time. Um, and so, and, and you know, a lot of companies lend themselves to a lot of organic sort of uh, viral acquisition in the beginning. Over time, to really scale, you start relying more and more heavily on paid uh, acquisition channels. And so we want to see a really sort of nice spread of uh, you know, projected lifetime value which can be hard to calculate in early stage companies, but there's some, you know, sort of elegant, uh, you know, shortcuts that you can take to sort of think through that um, to your customer acquisition costs um, and make sure that there's sufficient room in the economic model. Thank you. Um, everyone here understood every terminology that we used today. Yeah. Okay. Good. And I ask that because sometimes um, I know that when I've been on. On that side, I'm like writing every everything that you know the, the panelists are saying, and so I just wanted to do a check on that. So when you think about um, terminology, and you have an entrepreneur, and they have the right numbers, but somehow something is missing. And um, Kat, you spoke of the the team and the um, the chemistry between the team, right? An A player versus a B player. What are some of the dynamics or like core behaviors that make that distinction for you um, as you're reviewing who you're going to be investing in, right? Um, again, thinking about is this a scalable team? Um, do, they, do they have the ability to take this company to that next level? What are some of those core behaviors that you got? What are four? It's a great question. I mean, it's uh, it's um, it, it's it's a very subjective process, right? So I think that one of the things that we think about are um, you know the, the superpowers of the team that we're backing, um, and with every superpower is you know often a uh, you know this sort of the opposite, right? A, a skill that maybe is lacking, or that um, where, where you know somebody sort of over indexes and then sort of has a uh, related sort of thing that they under index on, right? And so we want to make sure that somebody, people are really honest with their skill sets, right? We want to make sure teams kind of understand where their shortcomings are and want to make sure they have a little plan to supplement those, um, you know? And, and so that's what I think the, the, the core sort of behaviors that we look for, the recognition of the fact that everyone has sort of things that are superpowers and things that are shortcomings, um, an honest assessment of those, and then an honest conversation about how to fill in those either functional skills gaps um, through recruiting talent, right? So um, it's a very subjective process. Um, 
But I think we just look for that sort of transparent self-recognition and self-awareness um, in the entrepreneurs that we back, uh, you know, particularly when it comes to the scale. Yeah, the only thing I'd add, I don't want to be quoted as saying A players and B players, because we're not judging the individuals per se. It's a lot more of, is this the right person with the proper background who is equipped with the knowledge to be building this particular company? So, uh, you know, I don't want to be the arbiter of whether you're an A plus or you're a B plus. I mean, we're all human, we're all equal. Uh, but I, I, there is an element of like, this person has seen this and therefore they're in a differentiated position to build this particular company. And the other thing I like to see is you want to see your founders hiring people that are the very best they can get. And never introduce this idea of, I don't want them to be too senior because they're gonna make me look bad. I mean, everyone should want the newest person to take their job away because they're so great. And if you see this element of like, ooh, we don't wanna to hire too senior because then they're gonna you know, overshadow someone else on the team, that can, that can just lead to a you know, moderately good team instead of a great team. Yeah, I think one of the points that you brought up is this interesting but the way that I think about it is kind of what's this team's unfair advantage and is it the fact that they've worked in the industry for a very long time and so they have this nuanced understanding. Because I think fundamentally ideas aren't unique people and execution capability is, right? And so I think we think a lot about that, right? Like why is this the right team to be building this business? Is it something in their past experience, their understanding of the nuances, their you know, relationship uh, network? Um, you know, what is the this team that makes them special and differentiated? Relative to just the idea I have to it. I think you also spoke. Thank you for that. Um, I, I actually took a note. So whenever I get this question, um, I, I'm just going to say, well, what were the execution capabilities? <laughs> Should be more value. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, when it gets down to getting it done, um, is when it's most difficult. And so in getting it done, there, before you actually get to the plan, there's a strategy, right, that you have to figure out how you're gonna grow, how you're gonna scale. And what should entrepreneurs consider when predicting what that revenue growth um, accuracy is going to be? What, what should that strategy be um, in terms of like their prediction? I mean, it totally depends on the stage of your company. I think at the seed stage, you know, Dollar Shave would probably just get orders in the door, they don't care how many, and they probably weren't really sharing with the board exactly what they were expecting. I think at the later stages, I mean, there's some expectation that you hit your numbers, and, you know, the VCs are involved in the whole board approval process for the budget for the year, so there should be some openness and uh, back and forth between the entrepreneur, the team, the VCs on like what are we trying to hit achieve this year. Uh, the other, like the other lever sort of is, it really depends on your ASP, right? So if your customer, if you're expecting to bring in two customers versus two thousand customers in a given quarter, over time you're going to be able to better predict the two thousand, right? The histogram is just going to be easier than if you have two customers and they're really big. Um, you could be lucky, you could miss one, you know, field reps calling a deal, and if you don't get the deal, well, you've missed your number. So, forecasting, I mean, forecasting is hard, and I say it's hard, especially because there are companies that exist in the world today, you know, startups in San Francisco, that are focused exclusively on sales forecasting. They sit on top, top of Salesforce data, and they try to do a better sales forecast, because they know that inherently we're flawed at forecasting. So. It's tricky. I think it only gets it gets easier over time, and it gets easier when you have n of two thousand or a thousand, ten thousand, a bigger number where you know sort of you don't not really. Yeah, I mean, I guess the only thing that I would add is from a VC perspective. Um, you know, really under like, what, what we look for is an understanding of what the key levers in the bottle are, right? So. Um, you know what? What, what the, the kind of discussion that we enjoy having with entrepreneurs is, um, you know, if you had all the resources in the world right now, how big could this be? Um, you know, what are the constraints to growth? Um, how do you think about trade-offs? Um, you know, if we invested this much versus this much, what would that do to revenue? Right. So, like, really understanding that people have this nuanced understanding of the levers in the model um, is is helpful to us. Because the only thing that we know is when we see a projection deck, right, and we see 
numbers. Like, the only thing we know with 100% certainty is they're wrong, right? Like nobody ever hits their projection in a fundraising deck. Um, people wildly exceed that or wildly underperform or, you know, plus or minus, but really having like a personal conversation around the levers is really, I think, the most, uh, the most sort of valuable for us. I've actually heard that a lot, right? That the, the, the um, at least from a projection standpoint, that they're wrong, right? The numbers are wrong. But what is that one common um, community identifier that is going to give you or the entrepreneur some um, accuracy or at least some um, possibility that they're headed in the right direction? At what point do we know, oh, these numbers are actually true or completely wrong? Uh, what is that term? I'll let the later speaking master <laughs> answer because for us there's so much variability. Or is there one? Yeah, I mean a lot of it's just math. I mean a lot of it comes back down to sales and marketing funnel and you know this is enterprise versus consumer or consumer it's virality and if it works, you know, it works and if it doesn't, they're toast. Uh, enterprise is a little more predictable and a lot of it is, if you get X number of leads in the top, how many are gonna come out the bottom? And if it's working, you know, that'll look, the ratios of that percentages over time will look similar. If it's not working, then you're gonna have some weird bulge in there that's saying, maybe you don't have enough SDRs that are qualifying deals, or maybe you don't have enough field reps that are doing POC, you know, whatever it is. And maybe your marketing team isn't robust enough and you don't have enough Know, people visiting the website, uh, but usually you can pinpoint, usually you really can just like stare at the funnel over time, the trend of the funnel, and say this is where it's breaking down. Earlier you mentioned, I mean, just from like the point seven, point eight, like specifics into when you hit a number, you have a million users, and then you know you're, you're going to be successful, right? But I thought in terms of understanding from um, a perspective of scalability that there may not just be um, functionality, but rather that there could be some specific turning point, right? But it sounds like there's no specific turning point, that it really is about what your product or service is, and then about your projection and the size of your team. Is that what I'm hearing? Like there's no specific, and you can't really be held accountable to growing at a specific rate, is that what I'm hearing? Right, I mean, I think there are rules of thumb and there are tons of blogs on all of this. You know, everyone has their opinion. That's one thing VCs have is lots of opinions. Uh, so, rules of thumb, you know, you should triple in the first <laughs> two to three years and then you should double thereafter. You know, you should get 100 million in ARR, revenue, whatever you want to, um, in what, six, seven years. You know, there are rules of, you would look at the last five or six IPOs recently, MuleSoft and Okta. Cloud era, I mean, lots of those, roughly 100 million in seven years. So there are rules of thumb like that. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you you have to do exactly that. Uh, likewise, you know, C Angel Seed, Series A, Series B, there are probably rough benchmarks for what someone is expecting to see if you're pitching a VC. Uh, but everyone is going to differ slightly. It's hard. But I think that's really helpful, right? That there is an expectation, that there is a benchmark, and that it's up to the entrepreneur to do the research and understanding how we should be measuring against that benchmark. Um, and particularly depending on which VC you're trying to get uh, in front of. Because again, depending on who they've invested in, that may be that benchmark that they're going to be measured against. Um, in thinking about what's like, what are the three most common for scaling decisions? Right, we spoke about like what are some things to look out, out for, um, some of the basic um, uh, trends. But what should be those? Gosh, you should not do that. Um, at least three that we should be looking for. I think one is uh, not letting go, right? So I think that's really, really hard for a lot of founders to do. Uh, but it becomes untenable over time because. You need to create layers of your organization to effectively scale. There's no way, um, you know, as, as sort of strong as you think your superpowers are, uh, there's no way to manage more than 
10 to 12 people at the very most as direct reports effectively, right? And so I think there was this infamous like Larry Page story, right? Where um, you know, he was at Google and he tried to take away all the layers and all managers, and um, that conceptually worked for a short period of time. Google very then quickly reverted back to a traditional, you know, sort of structured model, right? Because it, it ended up not working, right? And so I think even in the most well intentioned organizations, um, you know, having too many direct reports um, or not delegating as a founder. Uh, can be um, detrimental to the pace at which an organization grows, right? You become a bottleneck as opposed to somebody that uh, you know, helps sort of push the business forward. That's probably the most common mistake. Uh, the one most common mistake. Yeah, the other one I would say is lots of people think IPO is sort of the final culminating experience. But the Cloudera team would tell you that they went public on Friday and they still had to come to work on Monday. And people seem to forget. And I think founders actually go through, lots of founders who have gone public will say that there is just this like reeling moment on Monday, you know, this like hypothetical Monday when you show up to work and you still have to do your job. Your job has really only gotten harder. And so, you know, you can think of that at the IPO stage, you can also think of that as all the milestones along the way. Because, you know, we're talking a lot about scaling. What is scaling? Scaling really is just building a business. In startup land, we call it scaling and growth hacking. And, but but it's, it's still just fundamentally, you're trying to build something from scratch and your, your outcome in startup land is often, you know, you want an IPO or M&A. And, you know, something that you brought up at the beginning is lots of these companies maybe aren't trying to be venture back, And so that's a, a key question at the beginning. And maybe if you're not trying to go venture back, then you know you have a whole different set of, of decisions along the way. But if you are going venture route for ultimate big exit, then there are going to be milestones you hit along the way. And the next day after you hit you know said milestone, you still have to show up and focus on the next milestone. So I think we're, I'm just going to ask my last question and then I'm going to open it up for all of you. Um, and I think my last question is, as an entrepreneur, like how do you stay motivated? What have you seen works with those that you work with on a regular basis or that you sit on boards? Like, because that's part of your role um, or maybe part of your role. But what is that? Is it something they already have or do they surround themselves with their strategies or people to keep motivated? If they do want that bit scalable model. So I, I'm glad I'm glad you uh, brought it up. I mean, I think one of the bits of Silicon Valley is sort of like I think people are super human, not fallible, right? I mean, I think when you look at um, the entrepreneurial journey, um, you know, uh, it, it's it's really tumultuous, right? And I think that um, uh, while the most successful companies are often in the right, there's a lot of bumps along the way, right? And so I think. Um, whatever sort of coping mechanisms that people need to deal with sort of that, the fallibility and sort of the ups and downs, whether it's, you know, athletic pursuits or, um, you know, relationships or whatever, right? I mean, I think it's important to realize that people are human, right? And that people need the same coping mechanisms that you would in other industries, right? So I think that's sort of one. Um, you know, one of the things that my founders tell me is having a uh, core group of founder peers that are going through similar experiences that you can have really honest dialogues with and you can be vulnerable with. Because I think as a CEO, you often have to have your game face on with the company, right? You can't show significant vulnerability often to your employees, right? And so it's important to have that peer group perhaps with whom you can be honest and have those honest dialogues. And so I think that's another important you know, sort of thing that I've seen a lot of founders do. Yeah, if I'm being really trite, I think the answer is move to Silicon Valley because we're in the land of every building you turn to. It's Google, it's Facebook, it's you're just awash in tech success or entrepreneurial success in the Bay Area. So I think if you're an entrepreneur, then this seems like the holy land where you wake up and you can't help but be motivated to build a little faster and a little better. Uh, and I think it is no surprise that your average startup, I'll pick on Minneapolis, Minnesota, because that's where I'm from, but your average startup in Minneapolis probably doesn't wake up quite as hungry to be successful as you might hear, which you know, here we all are. Uh, so that's sort of the trite answer, and yeah, hard to know me on that. Thank you. So move to Silicon Valley.
<laughs> that needs someone come up. <laughs> Resilience. <laughs> we want you here. Although I do have to warn you, it's expensive. Um, <laughs> housing and everything else, and you people here know that. Um, I'm sure that many want to move to Brazil, so it's probably getting uh, competitive there too. Yes, yeah, seriously. <laughs> we, we all want to go there. Um, so I'm going to open it up and uh, give you an opportunity to ask questions or, or comments. Um, really, it's, it's a conversation. And I think that um, uh, having me around and walking with the mic is probably the best way. That way we can actually hear your question um, since we're being recorded this evening. Anyone have a question for our Yes. Do you want to share your name and then who you're with so that everyone here knows who you are? My name is Deshaun. I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm a wannabe. <laughs> uh, my question is uh, can you share something about the deal that you declined in? I think you just added what is the second part? No, we regret. Regret. Um, I mean, I think I would. I don't want to talk about specific deals, but I can say broadly, something that scale as a firm we deal with all the time is turning down a prior round where we probably said it was too early. And then we see the round, the subsequent round, and the company's doing well, and no surprise that the price is a lot more expensive. And we say, oh, if, if only we had invested in the earlier round. And I think where we often see it is you know, the great venture firms, I think, are the ones that are pretty unconstrained. So they do consumer, they do enterprise, they do everything, they do frontier tech, they do, they're willing to just experience anything that comes in the door. Uh, scale, being enterprise software focused, we, if it's an early deal and it's outside of our sort of series A, series B constraint, then we're a little bit less willing to give and we end up regretting it in the longer term. Uh, and we often look back and we say, oh, but you know, it was a big market, it was the right team, and we were just being a little too hung up on semantics. So I would say broadly, that's, that's something we toy with all the time. Um, so from a, I guess, consumer perspective, um, the challenge sometimes is, um, because you've been aged out of a certain demographic, or because you're surrounded by peers that are, you know, more homogenous than heterogeneous in their demographics or psychographics, um, you don't see a trend or don't relate to a trend, um, and so that's happened to be, I'd say, multiple times. I mean, I fight against it. I try to sort of like have a diverse group of friends, try to travel, uh, like force myself to. That's not a right? but like Gen Z, right? Like it's a thing. No one's talking about millennials anymore. It's crazy. Um, and so um, it's hard as a consumer investor to um, to not let your sort of views as a consumer bias your investment making decision. Um, and I would say some of my biggest mistakes have been in markets that I just didn't get. Yeah, I still don't get Twitter. My name is Luis Felipe from Brazil. I'm an ambassador of DFG. DFG uh, Growth 2016, right? The last fund. Um, are you guys looking at uh, NATO satellites, uh, startups? Uh, so, it's not, as a consumer investor of DFG Venture, it's unfortunately not um, a space that I spend any time on. Um, so, um, I. I Love to sort of connect with the white house and growth, but fortunately it's not me. But your team would do it. I mean, DFJ yeah, is sure. known for being, yeah. yeah. Not a focus area. We can't call that. Hi, my name is Joanne, and I have a question about the competitors that you briefly touched earlier. So how do you scale quickly, assuming that there are only two players in, in, the, in the game, in the space, and it's just between you and that person, and how do you, what are the tips you think that will make you scale better and bigger than the other person? I 
mean, <coughs> well, first I would say I don't think it matters if you have one competitor or if you have ten. If you have a competitor, then you can assume that they're out there trying to beat you as hard as you're out there trying to beat them. I mean, to see Uber and Lyft for details in San Francisco, I think they're duking it out right now. Uh, it's tricky. I mean, you want the land grab, right? Because you want to get more surface area, whatever it is you're selling the next guy or girl, gal. Uh, I think the tricky thing is if in 2014, 2015, everyone, VCs, press, everyone was talking about scale at all costs, right? Just put the pedal down and make it happen. I think 2016, 2017, current environment is a little bit more scale profitably, well not profitably, but scale efficiently. And so the, the tune has changed a little bit where Uber was just like full bore trying to amass, you know, a, chat, a war chest. Uh, the same doesn't apply anymore because ultimately you still need venture funding to, you know, you need someone to fund your scaling and so you can't just like, you can't go crazy. Uh, so I think with one competitor, I mean, you have to push it as hard as you can, but you have to be honest with the data where if, if the numbers aren't playing out such that you can make money on whatever you're doing, then, then it's, it's tough to push it. Um, and without knowing details, it, it's hard. And some of it is just, you know, go over here and do something different. If it's like they're doing content marketing, you do uh, Twitter, or, you know, whatever. You like try to fight a slightly different war than just like the exact same war. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a company that I work with right now that's sort of very much in that space um, where there's two competitors. It's a new market. It's so I think one of the things you can try to do is define the market, right? So. There's a lot of ways where you can sort of position yourself, I think, as the thought leader, whether it's working with analysts or through content marketing, but I think um, maybe over-investing, particularly given kind of, uh, if you're in a dual competitor market, um, of setting the standards through which people look at the market, and then obviously, you know, setting those standards such that your product supports those standards, um, I think can be an interesting way to, to potentially sort of define yourself into me. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I'm interested in like uh, what? Just a little closer. Yeah. What, what metrics do you look for in a startup? Uh, like, in terms of like seed round or Series A, uh, before you make your decision, that convinces you in terms of either traffic or uh, revenue, or profit. Like, what does it makes makes it a deal breaker for you? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so industry specific, right? So I think um, Kat and I would have very different answers depending on whether or not it was an enterprise or consumer company. And I mean, even within consumer, if it's a transactional consumer company, like a marketplace versus um, you know a social company like a Snapchat, um, you're looking at very different metrics. Um, so I think to Kat's sort of earlier point, at the broadest level, there are a lot of investors that have great blogs that sort of lay out, you know, for these sectors, here's kind of the trends that we're seeing. Here are the general milestones that we're seeing. Um, you know, so, so happy to talk about it offline, um, you know, based on kind of the specific area that you're focused on, but I think there's not one size fits all. I think it's very market specific, ultimately. Yeah, I think it's often not really about the, the individual metric, it's about the growth over time. Everyone is looking at near attraction. So it's it's all the you know percent growth over the last quarter, the last month, the last day and less about the absolute numbers themselves. I mean, I don't think most investors want to tell you that they have this minimum threshold for what visitors has to be to the website, or revenue has to be, or ARR has to be, or, um, and it's, it's tons more just about, is it tracking? You know, we want to look at something, whatever the chart is, I don't care. And I want to see that there's early rate traction, and I can extrapolate that if we plow money into the thing, it's going to go up to the right. I mean, that's, Pretty much all the VCs do. I want to ask the Brazilian team, what are they doing in San Francisco? And then turn it back into the QA. What's going on with you guys? Can, you, can someone tell me?
And you can say it in Portuguese. I think that would be our first time. Okay. You are Portuguese, uh, you are Starks. Uh, you are doing people from Brazil introducing lots of Silicon Valley. Uh, what you guys are doing here, like what kind of startups are here, what's like a, the tech business that's going on here, how to be in Silicon Valley. Some of the some of these guys are trying to move to this to this area. It's expensive as you guys told us, but they can afford to be here and invest in other companies that part companies or understand what's going on in Silicon Valley. Our structure in Brazil is very different. We don't have this kind of innovation. And the investment in Brazil doesn't have like uh, they have other opportunities to invest, like they have a risk free rate very low, they can make a real profit like six percent in a year. And maybe the investor here in the United States cannot do that. So people are trying to understand the model here, transport to Brazil. More or less that. That's cool. And so no more no more questions. Any general questions as it relates to VC funding, startup stuff? Oh, <laughs> okay. How long, how long it takes until the first contact and then you take a decision? As quickly as it needs to move, right? So I think that um, in, I'd say, the current fundraising environment, and it's changed a little bit, I'd say, um, but there are companies that we've, um, so, so I'm talking about ideal, ideally, and then sort of what happens in reality, right? So ideally, you form a relationship with the firm over time, you get to know the deal partner, uh, you know, the deal partner gets to know the entrepreneur, and so you kind of know what you're getting into, right? Because it's unlike a, uh, a sort of marriage between two people, it's the kind of relationship that you can't get out of, right? You're stuck with this investor, they're stuck with you. So you want to make sure the level of comfort is there, and that sort of level of comfort often takes longer than the transactional time frame to, to get, right? Um, I think what happens in reality is um, that that can happen, um, and does happen for a lot of deals we do. Uh, you know, for another set of deals, you know, we get introduced uh, mid-process, maybe towards the end of the process, and we have to make a very quick decision. And so one of the nice things I think about both, I imagine, at scale and at DMJ is we're a very small team. So for as big as scale, DMJ might appear on the outside. DMJ Venture is a team of eight investors. Um, all of us sit together in a small office in Buffalo Park. Um, and so decisions can be made very quickly and seamlessly. Um, and so, uh, so you know, I think tactically it's sort of as quick as the process pushes us sometimes. But ideally, you know, we very much like to be in the former category. I think it's for the benefit of both the entrepreneur and us. Yeah, from the if you're asking more from the entrepreneur perspective of how much time should you allot to raising funding, then I think you know, as he alluded to the process, I think you actually need to probably assume three to four months for the process. By the time you have the pitch deck ready, you've gone out to all your meetings, you've had second meetings, they've looked at your data, issued a term sheet, and then you know, 30, 40 days to close the deal and wire the money you're looking at. I mean, don't wait until you're almost out of money to do the fundraise. I would, you know, back it up three or four months and assume it'll take a while. Even though, yeah, sometimes <laughs> that VCs can move it. You mentioned we get introduced. Who usually introduces startups or founders to you? Or what's the best? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the best way is a warm introduction, right? I mean, I think that we um, uh, unfortunately get the kind of scale of email that I'm sure you know, everyone in this room gets. Um, it's very hard to be thoughtful uh, on cold email. So uh, my attention perks up when um, I'd say in this order, um, entrepreneurs that I work with is probably the best sort of single way. Um, you know, I tend to be very close to these people, I tend to respect their opinions. Um, and so I think, you know, sort of a fellow entrepreneur. Probably one of the DMJ's back is, kind of, is a very good sort of form intro. Um, seed investors tend to be a pretty good introduction, so I think there's a pretty sort of well um, sort of thought out ecosystem, right? Where you have pre seed investors that introduce companies to seed investors, then you introduce companies to A investors, and then I introduce to uh, scale for the series B, right? And so there's um, a nice sort of food chain, I guess, when it comes to stages. Um, so that tends to be a good source. Um, there's a third source that's maybe broader around. Um, you know, uh, people that are in this ecosystem more broadly, like lawyers, advisors, et cetera, and so that tends to be a source as well. But I'd say the first two tend to be where we get a disproportionate number of our good deals from. Great. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
If no more questions, then we would love to the invite. Um, who, who's going to pitch? So, uh, you can just come introduce yourself. Excellent. Thank you. So, we're just going to have a um, one pitch. We did have two, but the other person has a third up. So, uh, we're going to give the VCs great. Thank you so much.